So tell me a good joke. Clean or dirty? Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I know hundreds both kinds. All right. Here's a little story. I've been riding the judicial circuit. Came back to Springfield different way, got lost. There was a sign that pointed to the left to Springfield, a sign that pointed to the right to Springfield. I didn't know which way to go. By and by an old farmer came up. I said, does it matter which road I take to Springfield? He said, not to me. <laughs> I said, well, have you lived here all your life? And he said, not yet. <laughs> I said, you don't know very much, do you? He said, I'm not lost. <laughs> I said, well, I mean this. Uh, which road should I take to Springfield? He said, neither one. We need them both here. <laughs> I said, well, why'd you take an instant dislike to me? He said, it saves time. <laughs> Tell me another one. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Since, since we both have to give speeches from time to time, I... Heard about this man, he, uh, he decided he was going to start giving speeches, so he got a speech teacher, and the speech teacher told him, he said, now, when you give a speech, close your eyes. You have to concentrate on your thoughts. So he started closing his eyes, and it improved him a little bit. So by and by, he's going to give this speech, so he kept his eyes closed for the entire speech. And when he opened his eyes, everybody had gone. <laughs> Except for one little fellow sitting on the front row. So he said, well, I, I want to thank you for staying. I appreciate that. Just who are you? He said, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you tell me what. I'm afraid most of my jokes have been written by other people. <laughs> you think mine aren't? I just adapt to them. I'm not a manufacturer of jokes. I just am a retailer. Get it? <laughs> Okay, here's one. I already told you about my former aide, Rahm Emanuel, yeah. and his temper. Well, not long ago, Rahm, Rahm made a trip to Egypt. And when he was there, he rode a camel. And I told the press about the brute biting and kicking and spitting. And who knows what the camel did. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me one more joke. All right, one more. I visited this little town and, and where one of my generals had been born, and they had erected a statue to him. And so the, the statue had the uh, generals, uh, it, it had him in this weird crouching pose. And, and so uh, I, I said to the mayor, I said, it's a good likeness, but why this weird crouching pose? said, we run out of money. It's supposed to have been on a horse. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> Speaking of your generals, I understand that not too many of your generals were very sympathetic to black people. <laughs> Sherman, for example, was downright hostile to runaway slaves. Hmm. Sherman certainly didn't believe in racial equality. Not many of my generals believed in racial equality. <coughs> but Sherman was loyal to the Union. And uh, he did everything he could to save it. If it hadn't been for Sherman, I don't think the Union would have survived. I'm certain I would not have been reelected, which would have meant that my successor would have allowed slavery to continue. I've learned to take the bad along with the good. Well, since we're on this subject, let me ask you about racial equality. I know you fought slavery especially it spread. But you said some things about racial equality that I have problems with. I am not, nor have I ever been, in favor of bringing about, in any way, the social and political equality of the white and black races. I, as much as any man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Hmm. Was this one of my debates with Douglas? Yes, big crowd. 
Charleston, Illinois. Before I read the, a brief excerpt of your speech, I wanted to say it was painful for me to read your words because I revere you so much. Black leaders who know you, who know how much I revere you, throw it in my face all the time. So I want to hear your side. I've always admired you, but as a black man, as an African American, I have to say it hurts to read what you said. This wasn't a private conversation. This was something you said, on, not something you said off the record. That would be bad enough. But these were words spoken on a platform in Illinois before 15,000 people. I just wonder how you feel hearing those words now. Aren't you going to say anything? <coughs> when I have nothing to say, I found it's best not to say anything. Say something. What can I say? What you're known for, the truth. Truth is, I'm embarrassed. I was wrong. I have no difficulty apologizing when I'm wrong, and I am sorry. I have no right to expect you to understand or to accept my apology. There's no way you can go back and unsay what you said. Wish I could. I can't. Words, once you release them, take on a life of their own. Whenever somebody says something hurtful, I always ask myself, did he intend to hurt me? For me, intent is what counts. Mm. So what in the world was going on in your mind when you said those things that day? I was thinking mainly about getting elected. I'd be dishonest if I said otherwise. I was in a fight and I knew it. So you thought that saying that you believed in white supremacy, you thought that would get you elected? <laughs> Sadly, yes. If you read my whole debate, you'll see that my opponent knew I was much more liberal on racial issues than he was. I, he was trying to exploit it. But how do you think trying to convince the crowd you were just as racist as he was was going to help get you elected? <laughs> Looking back now, it didn't. Didn't help me at all. So what did it accomplish? Not much that day. But you know as well as I do, you want to change something, you have to start where you are. Not at some ideal place that you'd like to be. The overwhelming majority of the people in the crowd that day did not believe in racial equality. That is a fact. So you were pandering to their prejudices to get elected? The whole idea of representative government is that politicians represent the people of their district or their state. And that means representing their beliefs not necessarily your own. So then what you're saying is you were just expressing the opinions of the people of Illinois? Mm. Not just the beliefs of the people of Illinois, it was the law. Do you know what the racial laws were in Illinois when I ran for senator? I don't know the specifics. <laughs> Negroes could not vote in Illinois. They were prohibited from immigrating into Illinois without a certificate of freedom. They had to show their papers. Any runaway slave found in the state could be sentenced to 35 lashes. Negroes assembling in groups of three or more could be jailed and flogged. I was campaigning to become the U.S. Senator from Illinois, a position I understand you held about 130 years later. I ask you, what would you have said to get the votes of the people in that crowd? Not whether you agree with what I said, but as a practical matter, 
What would you have said if you expected to get their votes? That's not a problem I would have faced. I couldn't have run in Illinois in 1850. Precisely. But if you had been in my place in 1858, what would you have said if you were running against a man who was appealing to the fears of whites, who said blacks had no rights under our Constitution? That's a hard question to answer. Thank you. Times have changed. And I've changed. We are limited by the light that we have. I accept that. But you could have done better. What if on that platform that day, you had said something really, really bold? Oh, I wish I had. But maybe I hadn't grown enough for that. I was stuck with the prejudices of the time, just like the people in front of me. But, but could I ask you to keep reading from that book? You read just part of my answer. All right. There is no reason in the world why the Negro is not entitled to all of the natural rights enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. I hold that he is as much entitled to them as the white man. And when I said that, you know what the crowd did? They cheered. I was at least nudging them toward being more tolerant. Let me ask you something else. You said in an open letter published in a New York paper that it didn't matter to you if no slave were free, as long as the Union were saved. You said that, didn't you? I said that my official duty as president was saving the Union. But I also stated in that letter that my, pers my personal view is that all men everywhere should be free. But there were plenty of white men in 1850 who would never have said what you said. Theodore Parker, William Lloyd Garrison, Thaddeus Stevens, John Quincy Adams. I do not believe that one single one of those fine gentlemen was a registered voter in Illinois. <laughs> they lived in New England where many people had never even seen a colored person. In Illinois, where I live, I believed if I got elected, I could do some good, be less extreme than Douglas. I read a saying somewhere that it's wrong to do wrong just to get a chance to do right. What do you think about that? Sometimes you have to do a small wrong in order to get a chance to do something big. As I said before, I was expressing the prevailing beliefs of the people in Illinois. No. White males. Not all the people of Illinois. But that's who voted then. I had to start somewhere. I couldn't change everything. If I tried, I couldn't have been able to change anything. Don't you think that's what gives politics a bad name? <laughs> I'm a politician. I'm not a saint. I represent the people, people's representative. They have the strengths and the flaws of the people they represent. The people are a mixture of good and evil. I have some of the virtues and many of the faults of the people I now have the privilege of serving. The other night, I made a speech. It's not much of a defense, but it shows maybe how much I've grown. I may have grown a little bit. I recommended that we consider giving educated Negro soldiers the right to vote. It's not much. But what I said infuriated some people. One of Pinkerton's men told me there's a man in the crowd, a very prominent actor, he was muttering something about killing me.
Something else troubles me. You're known as a kind man. Is that a true characterization? I think it is. Yet you believe in what's now known as total war. I did not start out that way. First big battle, I hope, do what George Washington did at the Whiskey Rebellion. I thought that a show of force and the other side would stand out. You know, it didn't work out that way. Did you order Sherman to burn miles and miles of Georgia to the ground? Yes. Sherman says war is hell. He's right. There's no way to sugarcoat it. But I ask you, how much difference is there between the rebel sniper who fires the rifle that kills my soldier and the farmer who clothes and feeds the sniper? Is the farmer, the civilian, not a combatant because he doesn't actually pull the trigger? How much different is a house that General Grant burns in the siege of Petersburg from a farmhouse that General Sherman burns in Georgia? Sherman understood that before I did. Tell me about Sherman. Brilliant, erratic, fearless. He knew Southerners. He was teaching at a military institute in Louisiana when the war broke out. Sherman kept saying the only way to end a war with Southerners is to whip them completely. But you're a Southerner, born in Kentucky. Was Sherman right? If he was right, why didn't you see it sooner? I was a slow learner. <laughs> I, I'm like a Southerner in many ways, and I should have seen it. Southerners will fight you with their fists, shoot you if they've got a gun, and if they don't have a gun, they'll use a knife. And if they don't have a gun or a knife, they'll try to bite you to death. Excuse me. Yes. I'm still working, honey. Go ahead and eat dinner without me. I'm sorry. I'll come up in a few minutes to kiss the girls goodnight. We don't have much more time together, do we? Not really. A lot of people are saying that I need to start thinking about my legacy. Mm, it's a great piece of folly for a president to worry about his legacy. After a while, none of us will be remembered. The earth's full of the tombs of forgotten rulers. Were they wise? Were they foolish? Were they good? Were they bad? Hmm. Who knows? Who cares? It'll be a long time before anybody forgets about you. Your image is on our money. What money? The penny. The penny? <laughs> you can't do no better than that. And the five dollar bill. And for a while, it was on the $10 bill. Well, you see, I'm already slipping. <laughs> there are monuments to you everywhere. Listen, other presidents have been just as dedicated, just as patriotic, better qualified. There are no monuments to them. John Adams, for example, founding father, second president. Not a single monument to John Adams in Washington. There's still no monuments to him here. That supports my argument. Adams was a great man. He kept us out of a war, which at that time would have ruined us. I suppose we don't erect monuments to men who keep us out of war. Hmm. If I'd been elected in tranquil times, nobody would have ever heard of me. When I was a senator, sometimes I would look at the portraits of the presidents and realize that most of them are forgotten. I want to be one of the ones that's remembered. Hmm. You're certainly ambitious, just like me. <laughs> Think about it. We both, we both know where ambitious, ambition leads. We both have reached the summit. We're at the top of the mountain. 
We look around. There's no higher mountain left to climb. I don't think that it's that important how we remember. Somebody asked me how I wanted to be remembered. Here's what I told him. I said, I want to be remembered as a plain man who went around pulling up thistles and planting a flower where I thought a flower would grow. That's not a lot to be remembered. Oh, yes, it is. It's what we do, what we set out to accomplish that matters. What do you want to accomplish up here? I already said I'd like to be remembered as one of the great presidents. No, I already said, in fact, you said most presidents are barely remembered. I'd like to be remembered for being as great a president as you. Huh, great? In what year? 1862? 1863? Most 1864? Nobody thought I was a great president then. And what do you mean by great? Do you mean popular? Huh. When we lost battle after battle, I got blamed. And when we finally won some, I became a hero. But I had precious little to do with the disasters or the victories. That's debatable. But there's one thing you did do. You explained what the battles were about. As you said earlier at Gettysburg, you explained that the war was more than a battle between the North and the South. A lot of people don't understand that. I'm glad you do. Something you said at Gettysburg is what I want to do. Which is? You stated that this nation was dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I want to have a part in making that a reality. I want to push the cause of equality just a little bit farther. That you can do. That kind of greatness is within the reach of a president or just a plain ordinary man or woman. When you get to be president, people who knew you when you were a child, they say, oh, we knew he was going to be something great. Like uh, when I was born, people said I was the prettiest baby ever born in the state of Kentucky. <laughs> I hear the, uh, you, you're chuckling. I, I'm sure you think, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> when I was six weeks old, my daddy swapped me for an ugly baby. <laughs> And two hogs. <laughs> you know what? There's absolutely nothing extraordinary about me. I was just a floating piece of driftwood. But ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Just imagine somebody as plain as me playing a role in emancipating an entire race. Can I ask you another question? Sure. What are you afraid of? A friend of mine says you can't really understand somebody unless you know what that person's afraid of. So what are you afraid of? I don't know that I've ever told anybody that. Kept that pretty much to myself. People think they know me, but they don't. A few people caught on, they say nobody really knows me. Sort of like that. People will ford a stream where they can see straight through to the bottom. So why should I tell you? Because maybe it'll make me a better president. Fair enough. If I do that, will you tell me what you're afraid of? Yes. I've read a lot about you, but I don't know what you're going to say. And then we got a bargain. I'm ashamed, ashamed of my origins. Most people think that I'm proud of splitting rails, the log cabin, all that. Parts of my story, painful. For a long time, I was ashamed of my mother, Nancy Hanks. She died when I was nine. She was loving, had a brilliant mind, but she had a reputation. 
community talked about her. Small community, once your reputation is soiled. What they said about my mother got back to me. It hurt. Then there was my father. He didn't get, we didn't, we didn't get along at all. He didn't understand me and he didn't try to. When I was old enough, I left him. Never had much to do with him after that. When he was dying, my stepmother, who loved me and I loved her, she asked me if I wanted to come and see him before he died. I said, no. I didn't go to his funeral either. I just like to be carrying that around with you. But you asked me what I'm afraid of. After I began to be successful and started mingling with wealthy, powerful people, I was embarrassed about my past. I sometimes feel I do not belong up here, that I'm just an imposter. How do you deal with that? Courage. You can let your fears destroy you, or you can confront your fears. I resolved that I would not let my past determine who I am or what I can be. Something else I did. I found work worth doing. Like saving the Union and ending slavery? Something like that. Now it's your turn. Fair enough. For years, I've struggled with who I am. Michelle knows who she is. Both her parents are the same race. I'm the product of two races, black and white. She has a mother who's always been there and a father who comes home every night. My father abandoned my mother and me when I was two years old. Black activists, say I'm not black enough. White racists, they say I'm too black. You know, one drop of black blood makes a person black. Therefore, I'm not worthy of sitting in that chair. In Indonesia, I was a little foreign boy. And then in Hawaii, I was a little black boy with no money who went to, on scholarship to schools with rich white kids at the most elite school on the island. When I worked with poor people on the south side of Chicago, enemies made fun of the way I talked, the way I walked, my reading habits, my Ivy League degrees. Like who the hell does Barack think he is? So who am I? It's not always a bad thing not to know who you are. People who know exactly what they are sometimes set limits on what they can be. You told me what bothers you, but you haven't told me what you fear. Okay. Here it is. I fear failure. Complete utter, humiliating failure. Failing in public. I can understand that. I know why. Uh, I've had more than a few of them. But it goes beyond self-regard. I'm the first African-American president. The first black man to sit behind this desk. Ever. That's a burden that white people don't have to deal with. I represent all of my people. Millions of black people will suffer if I fail. If I fail, it will confirm every racial stereotype you've ever heard. 
And it will be a long time before another person of color gets to sit in that chair. I'm desperately afraid, afraid of failing. Mm. Both of us are. <laughs> I paced the floor of this big White House many a night. <clears throat> Same kind of fear. After the disaster at Chancellorsville is awful. Yet another failure. I paced the floor all night long. You know what I said to myself over and over? What will the people say? What will the people say? Hmm. I was thinking when I was listening to you just then, why don't you want to serve a second term? I've written down the pluses and the minuses, the hatred. My girls ask me why people hate me so much. I could become the head of a foundation, make a million, two million a year, plus a couple country club memberships, all the golf I could want to play, no criticism, dispense funds to worthy causes as I see fit, do a lot of good. There's a very good chance, you know, that I'll lose anyway. My reputation as the first African-American president is secure. I proved I can do it. But it's not fun anymore. Fun? <laughs> What's fun got to do with it? Maybe I shouldn't have put it that way. The demands here just grind me down. My critics know I hate conflict, so they exploit it. And the opposition is relentless. So angry, so illogical, so deceitful. I get blamed for everything that goes wrong. Nothing's changed. <laughs> If I don't run again, somebody will take up the fight. And if that somebody is from your party, he? Or she. She? Really, I'm not used to saying he or she. A lot of people aren't. But they'll get used to it. If I step aside, there's a good chance the United States will get its first woman president. <laughs> That's long overdue. But nevertheless, if you step aside, the new president will have different priorities. And if that somebody else is from the other party, you can be sure he or she will undo everything you did or try to. I'm just thinking how pleasant it would be not to have all of this on me anymore. How happy Michelle would be. The hatred would subside. I'm sure you know it's hard to explain to your wife and to your children all the vile stuff that they say about you. My wife was accused of being a traitor, Confederate spy. Mary's sister was married to a Confederate general. Mary was openly accused of treason. I was criticized because Bob was at Harvard, not fighting with, like other boys. You ask why I hesitate about a second term. Let me tell you the big reason, which almost kept me from running the first time. And what was that? Assassination. I thought you might be thinking about that. If you're the president, how can you not think about it? I don't want to leave the girls without a dad. Michelle and I had to confront that before I decided to run for president. She was afraid somebody would kill me. When I started campaigning in South Carolina, black people would come up to me and tell me they couldn't vote for me. Because if they did, it would be like signing my own death warrant. They said everybody who ever tried to do anything for black people got killed. President Kennedy and his brother Bobby. Medgar Evers. Cheney, Schwerner, Goodman. And of course, Martin Luther King. He goes with the office, doesn't he? It's a risky business, isn't it? Yes. Do you think our predecessors thought that way? 
I can't speak for all of them, but of course, I do think that maybe that's the way George Washington felt. What do you think? Man tried to kill Andrew Jackson, shot at him at point blank range, right at his chest. Pistol misfired. Otherwise, he would have been the first president to be assassinated. You can't show fear. The public can't stand a coward. I accept that. But you still have to think about it sometimes. That's all. That all of this could end. Just like that. How do you deal with it? I say to myself, I'll continue till my work is done. After that, it doesn't matter. Do you take precautions? Other people worry a lot more about that than I do. My old friend from Illinois, Ward Lemon, he, he sometimes sleeps outside my door. You should see him. Pistols, big boy knife. You know you need people like that, bodyguards. Not really. <laughs> Not till my work is done. A while back, somebody took a shot at me as I was riding back to the soldier's home. Horse reared up, the officer on duty rode back and found my hat, which had fallen to the ground. Bullet had passed right through my hat. I told the officer not to say anything about it. You know, that should have been a warning to you. More mm, a sign that my work isn't finished yet. Will Ward Lamon guard your uh, box tonight? I don't think so. No, he, he's going to be in Baltimore. But don't worry about it. Mary and I will be in the opera box. Look, I've been there before. There's a narrow stairway up to where we'll be seated. But why am I explaining this to you anyway? You're starting to sound just like Lamon or my wife, and you're forgetting what I just said. The president can't act like a coward. What will be, will be. There's no way to change what is inevitable. Shakespeare said it best in Julius Caesar. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Just because something's inevitable doesn't mean we have to hasten it. There's no such thing as hastening the inevitable. A lot of people would call that superstition. It's what I believe. Look, please don't go out tonight. Stay. Stay here in the White House. I beg you. Do you know what would happen if I told Mary I'd changed my mind? Can't afford to upset her. Ever since we lost Eddie, she's been unstrung. I, I can't do that to her. But if you go, you're... Listen, did you not hear what I just said? We are not going to talk about this anymore. If you go... Please, the thing is settled. So no more talk about this. If you continue, I'll leave you right now. It's Sasha. Yes, yes. I'm finishing up some important business here. Yes, I know I'm always finishing up important business. Let me call you right back. They want me to go upstairs and play roses and thorns with them before they go to bed. It's something we like to do with them. Go over the good and the bad at the end of the day. Roses and thorns. <laughs> what a nice game to play. You should do it. I wish I had done more of that kind of thing when my oldest boy was growing up. I was always too busy. Riding the judicial circuit at the office. Now I hardly know Bob. We lost one of our boys back in Springfield, little Eddie. <clears throat> that broke our hearts. I barely got to know him. I missed out. I was up here in Congress. Eddie lived just three years. Ten months, eighteen days. You know how many days? Oh yes, we counted the days. Put the number on his little tombstone. 
plus the words, of such is the kingdom of heaven. And you know about Willie. He died right here, didn't he? Yes, with a fever. Kindest, wisest, sweetest child. But we have Tad. I let him sit in on my cabinet meetings. Little Tad. Goes to sleep on my lap. I spoil him rotten. This afternoon, this Friday, I, Mary and I took a carriage ride down by Rock Creek. We talked about what we will do after my term of office up here is over. I told her we'd go back to Illinois and I'd buy a plot of ground for Tad so he could have a little garden all his own. He has a learning disability. And then we can take some trips together. I'd like that. I'd like to go to California. Maybe to Europe. Maybe to the Holy Land. I can do with him what I did not do with Eddie and Willie. You know, there's the business of this shop, and then there's your children. So go, go, go. Okay, sweetie. I'm coming right up. Is Audrey still there? Would you ask her to come down on her way out? Tell her I've made my decision. She'll know what I mean. See you in a couple of minutes. One final thought before I go. Find something you really believe in. And let people know it. And fight for it with all your heart. And those who hate you will hate you more. And those who love you will love you more. Got to go now. Can't tell you how much, how very much this has meant to me. And to me. I'm glad to see that government of the people has not perished from the earth. Goodbye, Mr. President. Did you see him? See who? Lincoln. He was right here. Really? Yeah, he was right here. He looked just like his portrait. Talked about his plans. Told really bad jokes. <laughs> he was right here. What do you think? I think you need a rest. You're not taking me seriously. Should I? You haven't been smoking, have you? And I don't mean Marlboro. Surely not in here. Maybe you just doze off. I'm serious. Tonight was like two time frames touching each other. You know, quantum physics tells us there may be multiple universes. Will quantum physics tell me what I should say to the press if word gets out that the president thinks he talks to dead people? Well, maybe it was a White House ghost that the tour guides always talk about. And maybe, sir, you need a vacation. I know. It sounds crazy. Sasha told me you made your decision. I have. I'm going to do it. I am so glad to hear that. And after I'm elected? The people are going to know that they re-elected a fighter for president. I was afraid you weren't going to. What made you decide? Not what? Who? Did you hear that? 
Hear what? I didn't hear anything. heard a lot tonight.